My name's Steve Trumbull and I'll be facilitating the uh, webinar tonight. Uh, our focus, as you can see, is in collaborating to recognise and address the mental health impairments of loneliness. Um, I'm a GP myself by background, but my current role is as uh, Head of Medical Education at the University of Melbourne. Uh, I'm going to introduce tonight's panel, although you've already had the uh, bios disseminated and if you wanted to read more, there's a tab at the bottom under libraries that you can have a look at to find out uh, more about who's who. Um, also you'll see that there are, uh, the, there's the opportunity to ask questions, so we'll come to that in, um, in just a moment. But before, I would like to uh, have a, a quick hello to each of the panellists. Now first of all, we have Dr. Michelle Lim, who's a psychologist uh, based at Swinburne University. So hello, Michelle, and welcome to tonight's webinar. Thanks, Steve, for having me. It's a pleasure. So you've really got your whole career involved around loneliness. What triggered your interest in that area? I actually think I stumbled into that. Um, I was actually a social anxiety researcher and also um, focused on looking at people with serious mental illness. And loneliness, obviously, is a condition that afflicts uh, both of these um, conditions as well. And um, I happened to be doing a postdoctoral research fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis and stumbled into doing or measuring loneliness in one of my studies and it just kind of snowballed from there. Okay, great. Well, it's good to have your expertise tonight. We've also got Dr. Jonathan Ho, who's a general practitioner in Wagga Wagga. So welcome, Jonathan. And uh, um, I think you're sitting outside there in Wagga, so showing off the, uh, the climate up there in rural Australia, <laughs> welcome. Now, you do a lot of work with youth in a rural setting, and have you found loneliness to be an issue for that particular group? Uh, loneliness, I think, um, especially for the youth, they might not be able to put a label on it. They might be able to recognise that something's just not right. But um, as a GP, um, it's a great opportunity that you can actually engage with them and uh, walk through this particular journey. And uh, it's more of a conversational journey. Um, and, and sometimes they, they might actually come up with it themselves that they actually feel lonely or you can uh, assist them in just asking them, you know, what, what do you think loneliness is? And they might actually recognise actually they're feeling quite lonely. Absolutely. Great. Well, well good to have your expertise tonight too. And finally, but certainly not least, uh, Lisa Brophy. Now, you're a social worker and a professor at La Trobe University again here in Victoria. My interest in loneliness really came about because um, I've worked in mental health for pretty well all of my career um, in all sorts of different roles, um, most recently in research. And probably my research experience intersected with the experience that I had when I was actually working um, in the community with clients, that um, a profound experience of people is to feel lonely. Um, they might describe that in all sorts of different ways as Jonathan suggested, but still um, this profound sense of um, sometimes people having very minimal contact, sometimes the only contacts that they have are professionals um, that are working with them um, and a lack of intimacy in their lives and, um, and I could see, uh, and I think they can see too, that this is really having such a significant impact on their general health and well-being. Um, and then I became really interested in this. I got onto Michelle and said, I hear you're really into this and um, managed to get myself on the uh, Australian Council, uh, the, the, um, the Council of Environmental Health's um, Expert Advisory, or Scientific Advisory Group, so that's been a great thing for me. Fantastic. So immediately you've got a, a network and a community of practice in the area. That's, 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 that's wonderful. That's great. Um, Okay, so welcome to all of you and obviously we're well over a thousand people now on the, uh, the webinar so uh, each of the participants is a contributor um, and we look forward to hearing your questions. There's a, um, a chat box uh, that you have there for general chat and there's plenty of conversation going on there already. Um, we're already uh, hearing from everywhere from Perth to Queenscliff via Menzies Creek and Darwin so that's great, it's a really good diverse, diverse group. Um, so please do chat between yourselves there and if you've got a question you'll see there's a tab down the bottom there uh, which is um, uh, appropriately called ask a question so please click on that if you wanted to ask a question and that will be um, accumulated by the staff at the Mental Health Professionals Network and uh, presented to the panel as a question when it, it, it's the right time. Um, 
So what's going to happen now is that uh, we've got a couple of case studies that have been already circulated. Each panellist is going to give a short response to the case studies that it relate, as it relates particularly to their area of practice. Uh, and there'll be some conversation between the panel, hopefully uh, a more scintillating broadcast than the budget speech last night. Anyway, we'll get to that. Um, and also then we'll move into a Q&A um, opportunity, which will be where uh, we'll have um, responses to the questions that have come up from the audience. Um, and that's really where we want to spend the majority of tonight's activity uh, in responding to issues that are important to you as participants in this, um, in this webinar. Um, I wanted to particularly remind you of the uh, learning objectives of the, uh, the webinar, sorry, learning outcomes, there they are. So these are really important and we need to check at the end that we've met these, so please let us know via the chat board if we haven't. First one is looking obviously at the factors that are associated with loneliness and what distinguishes loneliness from just being alone. Um, also distinguishing between loneliness and depression, using appropriate language when we're working with clients who we think might be suffering from loneliness. We're going to look at barriers, particularly the physical barriers, ge geographical barriers and things like that that might inhibit uh, social interaction. And finally, we don't want to finish tonight without um, giving you a chance to consider in your own context what might be a referral pathway you could use to support people who are experiencing loneliness. So they're the learning outcomes for tonight. Um, what we're going to do now, though, and I'm sorry to be dancing around on the slides a bit, but uh, we're going to get into the case studies. As I say, you've already read those, so we won't go through them again. Um, the reason they've been chosen is, I guess, to draw attention to two quite different people who are both uh, possibly experiencing loneliness. And we'll have Michelle uh, particularly talk to the first one from the psychology perspective, uh, Jonathan giving a general practice perspective, and we'll move to the second case study, Lisa speaking from a social work perspective, and then uh, Jonathan from a general practitioner perspective, but always looking at how the professions can work together in order to get the best outcomes for our clients. Um, so that's what we'll do now. Um, we're doing well on our timing, so we'll move straight to um, Michelle. You're going to talk to us about the case of Dean. So I'm going to kick off here on the first case study, which is Dean. And I had identified actually the, the two major changes in Dean's life. So um, there's a change in parental responsibilities. So in this case, uh, two adult children have actually moved out of home um, and also a loss in his occupational role. So um, socially, he would have, um, I guess, a two social losses here that uh, were there before and now no longer there. So I think what's really important um, if Dean is unable to, to recognize these changes is to acknowledge that these are two major life changes uh, probably occurring in a, a short uh, time frame. And if Dean does report stress or loss um, or uncertainty around these events, I think it's really important to empathize uh, with Dean. Um, just, you know, um, it's really important to acknowledge that you understand that that's actually a change. He may not recognize that, but I think it's important um, to identify those two changes. Then moving on, I think there's a couple of issues here with the way Dean has kind of thought of, about, himself, about himself within the social context. There's some reluctance here for Dean to actually socialize about his wife. Um, I guess I really would like to explore uh, what this reluctance is, is about um, and also what role did he think he was playing um, in his social networks before he was retrenched. Uh, did he initiate any of these friendships or did he maintain them or what, what kind of role did he, and I guess what kind of specific role did he play in that relationship dynamic? And also, if there's that reluctance, what, it, what would it actually mean if he did socialize with these uh, friends without his wife, so not being dependent on her? And if it does elicit some discomfort, I think it's really important to ask why. Um, and it might be tied to perhaps um, unhelpful assumptions about, um, about his ability to uh, initiate or maintain friendship. So it's really important to address those things if, if they do come up. 
I think one thing that we often miss and we're not very good at is actually goal setting. Um, a lot of people who do feel lonely um, don't necessarily uh, want to have a goal of, ex of making many, many new friends. I think uh, we need to figure out if Dean actually would like to, uh, is it that he want to make, does he want to make new friends or actually just rebuild the, the current social networks that he has or just gain more confidence. Um, on top of that, does he actually have the resources to actually do those things? So are those goals actually realistic? Um, there are a lot of people, as you would know, actually don't have a rich social environment. Um, maybe in Dean's case, you know, he might be socializing uh, or was socializing at his work uh, and within his family settings, but he may not have had any kind of strong friendship networks around him. Um, does he even have uh, the ability to access, um, you know, sh shared interest groups? So, ex you know, can he afford to go to the gym, or, or, or does he have access to, um, um, you know, libraries close by? Is he in a rural area? We, you know, it's really important to kind of figure out the context that he's embedded in. And again, I think this is tying back to: does he actually have the financial ability to support some of these social activities? In terms of uh, coming from a CBT perspective, I think it's really important to identify if Dean actually holds any kind of negative assumptions about new friendships. Often we find that people who are lonely um, often have assumptions that friendships should be easy or should be organic or should just flow, but actually friendships do take a lot of work and sometimes they, well, most of the time it comes with being an acquaintance and then from that acquaintance status, um, it moves towards a friendship status through hard work. So I think it's really important, um, if there are any kind of negative assumptions about making friends, it's important to identify those ones. And sometimes people have these negative assumptions because they've had negative experiences, you know, people who may have let them down in the past, or, you know, people who they assume would have their back, didn't have their back, and it mm -hmm. could even occur within the family context. Um, managing those unrealistic or unrealized expectations of making new friendships. Um, often when people are older as well, they have these expectations of, oh, it's not much of a point <laughs> making new friends, <laughs> you know, and well, you know, if I make new friends, I'm, you know, it's, you know, or I, they move away, it's going to be too hard or um, I'm too old to make new friends, you know, th those kinds of, um, I guess, that kind of unhelpful thinking is, is not, um, it's not, it's not going to help you uh, target that loneliness um, severity. So again, another thing, another common assumption is that people would think, well, friendship should just click and should be organic. Um, if I meet someone, I should immediately like them or they should immediately like me. Again, it's not a one size fits all and there's so many people in the world, like Dean needs to understand it might be a trial and error process. And also getting Dean to um, think about what does it mean for him to develop a meaningful relationship? So what's actually meaningful for him? Because what is meaningful for him is not going to be meaningful maybe for someone else. And maybe even the way men might relate to friendships. So think about friendships might be quite different to women. Um, men may, may and in generally, generally may feel, um, I guess, satisfied with um, friendships that whole um, a particular kind of conversation that might not, you know, might not be sufficient for women, for example. So what was it, what is it for specifically for Dean himself? It might not be a, you know, a gendered kind of uh, typical response from Dean. So it's really important to hear what he wants. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. That's great. That's a really good start yeah. for us. Really important. Yeah. And, um, it's interesting some of the things that have come up already in the, okay. the chat uh, about people who are suffering a, a loss such as after divorce mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and whether that uh, sort of fear of getting hurt, um, you know, you're talking about friendships and uh, I guess some of the challenges involved in making and sustaining friendships and mm -hmm. whether a much more intimate relationship becomes harder to contemplate uh, such as after a divorce which has been quite painful. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's quite a common, um, I guess, concern that a lot of people actually do 
talk about, especially men after after divorce. Um, often they find themselves in a position where uh, maybe their partner may have taken some of the friendship networks with them post-divorce, and they find themselves kind of needing to rebuild. And when we're talking about loneliness here, just making sure that people understand that this is not about lack of social skills, it is a lack, it is more of a lack of social confidence in terms of rebuilding those networks again. Um, so it's really important that um, in general that we always nurture our friendships and our social networks uh, regardless of what stage we're in because it's really important to to always have that safety net of, of friends um, that can support you through these difficult times. Yeah, and even if there's a financial cost involved in um, having activities, that cost is well offset by the benefits of um, contact with people. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Another issue that's come up before we move to Jonathan's perspective is about um, older people uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the issue of loneliness in the elderly. Is it something that you wanted to address now in particular, Michelle, or should we put that to later? Um... Yeah, we, we can address that now if you like. Sure. So what is specific uh, to an older person who finds themselves lonely by, I guess, the inevitability of losing important people in their lives as, mm. as they've got older mm. as well? It's a really, really difficult question because bereavement, for example, is a huge um, factor. And sometimes people who are bereaved may surround themselves with people who may be friends, but they never feel it's the same thing and it, it never replaces that loss of that meaningful relationship. Um, it's a very difficult question but you know how do we, it's impossible to replace those things and so how do we then still live and flourish and thrive post um, bereavement. I'm, I'm not sure if anybody else has a, <laughs> you know has any ideas but I think it's important that uh, we do look out for people who are in that position um, as mental health professionals. I think um, it's possible to rebuild and I have seen clients who have been care caring for their spouse and you know 50 years of marriage and the spouse pass passes away. You know little steps like you know getting them into social um, structures like going to the gym and making new friends and and speaking to people um, actually those things can help and I have seen people repartnered post bereavement as well and actually uh, into their second marriages so those things are are possible but it's a difficult journey and, it's, and really does require uh, the support of people around them as well as mental health professionals or, who, or, or their doctor. Yeah, no, true. And just before we go to Jonathan again, I'm sorry to put you off again, Jonathan, but I'm just curious in Lisa's view on um, this concept of the labour within the relationship. And it can be hard work, and a lot of that does seem to fall to uh, women in relationships. Is that a fair comment? Look, I think so, and I think that's what's often found that women will often be taking up this emotional labour. So, um, and what I mean by that is, you know, the the person who makes contact with friends and family and organisers events and all of those kind of things and often I think men um, you know suddenly um, got to invest in that themselves and it may require a new set of skills that they haven't even really been introduced to or um, haven't thought were going to be necessary for them to develop. So even talking about the fundamentals of um, who, who organises family events and so forth um, might be a way to get started in thinking about that. Um, because it may be that other people in the family or other friends aren't necessarily abandoning that person. It's just that those links um, have been lost somehow, perhaps through the loss of that person who's done the labour around it, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, thanks for those insights. Well, back to you, Michelle, just uh, again with this case. Um, uh, tell us more about, about Dean. The thing with Dean is that we got, in thinking about a behavioural approach, uh, again, this, this is very unlikely to be a social skills um, 
aspect to that, that the fact that he doesn't have social skills and therefore he's lonely, uh, for us is about social confidence. So what are the safe and feasible options for Dean? Like for the clients that I've worked with, for example, post bereavement or post divorce or um, due to significant life changes, you know, asking them to join a group is just completely unfeasible. Um, and especially if you also work with clients with a serious mental illness, um, they may feel very judged um, with particular activities or very self-conscious about, you know, going uh, to a particular shared group um, type setting. So how do we kind of make these options safe and also feasible and doable and then kind of setting them up for success? Uh, for me, when working with some clients, I would kind of focus on participating uh, and making efforts rather than actually going, yeah, you should make a friend. <laughs> actually, the fact that you are going to, um, you know, a setting where it allows those opportunities to happen, that's great. And then the next time, perhaps saying hi to someone and the next time actually learning about someone a little mm -hmm. bit more, even if it's a superficial way. So taking those steps and, and not be afraid of small talk because small talk then opens up more deeper conversation. And a lot of people, again, go, I hate small talk. I don't want small talk. But actually small talk is an opener and a step uh, for people to kind of uh, get to know you. So that would be the way I would look at a behavior activity for him or be a behavior approach and just getting him to kind of build his confidence over time rather than go and make a new friend. Again, you know, um, as clinicians, we've got to be mindful about what, what will work for your client. That's a really good segue into hearing from Jonathan about his perspective of the small talk concept in that uh, I think um, a lot of people observing general practitioners say there's an awful lot of um, small talk in the consultation, but in fact, it's important. So what can you tell us, Jonathan, about your response to Dean's case? GPs as specialists uh, have a quite unique perspective because um, often the, the patient actually chooses us as the specialist, um, rather than you know another doctor referring a patient to another doctor. So um, the other thing that's unique is we have a longitudinal relationship as well, mm -hmm. um, and so that um, we might not be able to broach the subject you know right off the bat. It might just be a blood pressure check, um, and you might not get that opportunity, um, but you might have that opportunity later on. The other thing is, as a GP, um, particularly working in a regional setting. Um, it's a privilege to actually work with, I call my brothers and sisters, um, you know, allied health, um, other practitioners, um, and we, um, with the consent of the patient, of course, uh, are able to share information as well as to build on each other's expertise. So um, I might actually get, um, not, not, not get from um, Dean um, that he's lonely, but um, I, I might actually get that hint from one of my colleagues, and that could actually guide me with my conversation with, with Dean. So that's so, um, um, sorry, go on, Jonathan. No, I'm, I'm, good. I'm good. Go on, Steve. I was only going to say that that continuity that GPs offer is so important. That's your perception as a social worker, is it, Lisa, that you would see that that longitudinal connection with GPs, the continuity is very important? Oh, look, I think it's, it's such a rich thing that, um, I think it's such a rich thing that GPs can offer, that continuity. Um, and we often see people, especially in the mental health service system, um, engaged in what's a very fragmented um, uh, care system. And GPs can be that really good base that is the person that maintains that continuous relationship. Um, and I think it's often what people say. They want people to give them more time and they want people to give them continuity. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, I guess building trust can only really come through spending better time with people and maybe revealing a little bit of the authentic self. Um, yeah. I'm just curious, Michelle, I've heard you mention before that um, you've worked with clients who say that when I show my true self, people don't like it uh, mm -hmm. and you end up playing a role. How do we deal with that if uh, we encourage um, clients to put themselves out there a little bit and they say, well, people don't like what they see? That's, that's awfully difficult. 
Mm. Yeah, I, I think it's really important. That's a very common uh, experience that people say. So if I really show who I am, then people are not going to be, want to be friends with me because they, all they see is weakness. So really, that's a, a issue with their self-esteem here and how they think they perceive themselves. It's really important to check for any kind of co-occurring social anxiety as well. Uh, because that can really uh, contribute back to loneliness. But I mm. think my, my take on this when the client says that to me is actually maybe you're actually going to the wrong people. You need to be finding your tribe mm. and the people that who like you for who you are. Uh, often people, what they do is they then put up this front of this person that they're not but and trying to kind of relate to people that way. And people can kind of sense there's something not quite right and kind of pull back. And so... You know, how do you convince your clients to actually say, well, actually, you're just going to the wrong people and you should, you know, yeah, maybe perhaps try this, you know, um, or perhaps there are people around you that um, are better, um, a better fit for you, but you just haven't quite got there yet. So it might be a trial and error process. Yeah, and there's been quite a lot of discussion in the chat group about the use of alcohol as a way of uh, mm. sort of getting some confidence in social situations, but that's got to be a flawed um, uh, strategy, I would have thought. Mm -hmm. And that's also very consistent with people with um, kind of uh, problematic levels of social anxiety as well, using alcohol, especially with, with young people, um, using alcohol to actually then build or be more confident to actually talk to other people, but then the alcohol actually makes them act a little bit silly and then they get embarrassed that they may have said something and then they can't remember what they said, so it becomes this vicious cycle. Absolutely. So obviously, I mean, I must say I share an age with Dean, so I've got a lot of uh, sympathy as well as empathy for him and his situation that he's found himself in and obviously there are um, many factors that have led to that. But let's look at the next case study now um, and as I say it's unusual for us to have two cases but they're two quite different cases and uh, people will have read um, uh, the story of our, our next case and the situation that she's found herself in. And Lisa, you're going to um, talk about your responses to uh, this situation. So over to you. Here we have Jess's situation where she's kind of been knocked up and um, pregnant and knocked off her trajectory. Um, and she's had this kind of significant loss of friends and social network um, that's been a kind of very um, disruptive event in, in her life um, where she's moved away from uh, her home and her family and all her informal supports really. She's got some new ones but um, she's had a significant erosion of her informal support network. Um, and I, I read Jess's story and I think about how disempowered um, she is and how she must feel as well. And also the, the amount of stigma that um, we see in perhaps the reaction that's um, happened around her pregnancy, but also that might translate to her own feelings of self-stigma as well. Um, and I also see her as a young person who currently lacks a lot of the support and advocacy that she might need to um, actually be able to negotiate this situation. And I think it's actually really important to start thinking about how to get Jess kind of back on track, if you like. Um, because what we know is that otherwise, if um, she continues on this trajectory of not um, being, in, being engaged in education, not being engaged in employment. And really, I, could, I think you could even say that she doesn't even have adequate, safe and stable housing at the moment. I'm not sure how sustainable um, living with her aunt and uncle actually is. Um, then I think she's got some really important um, risk factors happening around perhaps um, ending up on a tra trajectory where she does um, end up being diagnosed with a mental illness when in fact now might be the time to actually really start thinking about the social determinants in relation to just the situation. It's, all, um, you know, it's interesting how loneliness can actually invite us to actually start thinking more about the social determinants when it comes to mental health. Um, and education, employment and housing, um, you know, that's such an important place to start where Jess is concerned. But actually in um, having conversation with Jess, I would still say that it's actually important to ask about loneliness and it's just how she feels. Um, how does she kind of um, describe her situation? How does, you know, there's, one, there's this kind of idea about, you know, how does she construct the presenting problem, if you like? Um, what does she, she see happening? And this is about really 
you know, seeing Jess as an expert on her own life and sending that message to her that she is um, the expert. And is being lonely um, a meaningful way to talk about what's happening or has she got a different kind of language around that? Um, with someone like Jess, um, you know, who's already got to year 12 and um, is probably pretty articulate or we can assume that she might be, then that's going to be important. But, um, but you know, maybe um, if we might think about someone who doesn't have, like young men, for example, that I've worked with in the past can have a lot of difficulty articulating um, what's happening to them. And I think Jonathan actually touched on that. But even so, it's important to get a sense from Jess about how she can, how she wants to talk about what's happening. Um, and I suppose the message for me here is that it's really important for Jess to be starting to think about rallying the supports um, that are around her and actually talking about her situation um, because otherwise there's the possibility that that will erode as well and she won't have um, the support that she needs in the longer term. But it's, and that means that we're kind of in this together of talking to her about um, what's happening and what we might be able to do about it and it's a very important time to act. I couldn't stress more about, to me, when I read this case study, I think it's really important now to be starting to think about Jess and her social relationships. So um, the good news is that loneliness can be a motivation as well um, um, as an inhibitor of social connection. So um, this is about the idea that feeling lonely can often mean that we actually want to you know, connect with other people and want to do something about it. So that might be something that we could connect in with, with Jess here. Um, and then to actually start talking to Jess about how she could be more empowered in her situation. How, how can she actually get some more control over her situation? Um, and getting started with those kind of conversations can actually be good in terms of thinking about what are her values, um, what are her preferences, what, what, are her, what choices, if any, does she have? Um, I was thinking, you know, a young person like this has got so much to teach us about um, social media and what platform she likes to use and is it Instagram or is it, you know, like she probably doesn't think Facebook's, you know, um, old hat now or whatever. Um, and so those experiences that she's having on social media would be really important to explore um, and think about as well and maintaining that sense of, again, that her have been the expert here. But what are her strengths? She's already talked about how she wants to do nursing. She's um, already got to year 12. There's a lot happening for her that could be built on. Um, and we just talked about these issues around social identity and, and that sense of self. And what the literature would tell us is that actually having some kind of bond or sense of belonging, um, you know, something in common with other people. And whether she constructs that online or she constructs that through the country town that she's living in, but something that actually enables her to um, rebuild her sense of self and social identity might um, depend on contact with other people, other like-minded people. Um, it's really interesting when you read the loneliness literature, I think it's actually a bit silent on um, families and family engagement, but I can't help but think that in this case we've got a very important situation in relation to Jess's family. Um, she's about to have a baby, There's, I know there's conflict and there's difficulties and we might be reacting quite strongly to the idea that her parents have made such a drastic decision um, in uh, sending her off to the aunt and uncle. But on the other hand, it may be important to actually engage with him and connect with him if Jess gives us permission to do that. I suppose again, in terms of her being an expert on her life, then her defining who she sees as family now might be actually important. Who, who does she see as the, the key supports in her life and who are the family members that she think would be available to support her? Um, we've already talked about community connection and there's lots of possibilities um, for community connection, I think, um, that would really depend on Jess's um, preferences, really. Um, I was kind of hoping that one of the things that Jess might like to do is actually learn to drive. Um, you know, for example, there's lots of, the Vic Roads has a program that um, where volunteers assist young people to learn to drive. That would be something that could enable, be very enabling when it came to community connection in a, um, in a country town. I'm sure some, a lot of the people on the webinar have got experiences of how to 
assist people in these more isolated situations. And finally, um, peer support is another area that I'm very interested in. It's a, it's a growing area in terms of um, being seen to uh, provide significant um, uh, optimism about the kind of support that can be offered to people. And that kind of shared lived experience um, can be really important in terms of engaging people, building trust, and all the things that are probably really important for Jess currently. I'm very attracted to um, this particular um, study, um, the Community Navigation Study. Um, it kind of in some ways encapsulates a lot of um, what I've been talking about in terms of Jess. Um, what they're doing, it's a study in the UK and it's linked to um, this idea of social prescribing. Now, the other thing about the Community Navigation Study is that it actually also includes some um, a small amount of um, financial support for people, so £100 in the UK. And I think that's actually really an interesting thing because what we've got here is someone, is Jess, is probably on Newstart and we've, this Newstart's been a lot in the news recently and um, it's going to be very difficult for um, a young person to be managing on that very low income. So um, some kind of finding some way of enabling Jess to get access to extra um, financial support might be important and that's where my family might come into that or there might be other resources that she can draw on. Um, but being socially focused is all about enhancing an individual social social world. So this is this, this study is really about thinking about mapping, helping someone map their social world, um, then developing knowledge of the local community. Um, so really having a sense of what's available for people. The community navigators um, are really about being future focused and looking for positive solutions and using the person's strengths and resources. So being there with someone um, and guiding them. And I suppose this is aspirational, isn't it? We don't necessarily have community navigators in all the places where we're working. But we might have people who can sort of in some ways adopt this role in relation to someone that we know um, is experiencing loneliness. So being per person centred is another aspect of this. Um, being individualised and working with the, the person's needs, goals and preferences. And Michelle's already talked about the importance of being able to sort of talk to people about their goals. Um, and working with the person rather than doing to is so critically important if we're going to have that kind of message of wanting to empower people and help them make their own choices about their lives. And this fits with this final aspect of the principles of community navigation which is um, allowing the lonely person, if that's how they're defining themselves, to direct the pace um, and the journey that they take together with the navigator. And um, if you read the paper, it talks about this GROW model, which is really about helping people set goals. Is it realistic? Um, you know, what are your options and how can we find a way forward? Um, and um, yeah, I, th I, um, I think it's actually a great study that I'd encourage you to look at, but hopefully it's a useful way also to think about how we might um, engage with what's happening with death. Thanks, Lisa. And that word navigator really jumped out when you were talking about that strategy of uh, a simple skill like learning to drive. I mean, it just sounds perfect in that it, it's a way of overcoming a physical barrier to loneliness if she can yeah. access the vehicle to be able to transport herself and, importantly, her new baby to see mm -hmm. other people away from the aunt and uncle. And uh, I have heard it said that um, teaching a teenager to drive is a perfect way to engage without eye contact. Yeah. Uh, that you cannot sit face to face without risking an accident. So it's a it's a really good way to have that um, supportive interaction, teaching a useful skill. So it's a it's a fabulous concept. Because Jonathan, back to you. Clearly, Lee, um, sorry, uh, Jess is going to walk through your general practice door with a a baby in her um, abdomen that she's no longer looking forward to the arrival of. She must be at significant risk of postnatal depression. Um, is this something that you confront in your practice? Yes, yeah, Steve. So often it might um, be as simple as when you're doing your Edinburgh depression scale, that sort of flags, you know, either um, risk of um, mental health or, um, you know, some psychosocial problem. Um, and if loneliness is actually identified as part of that, um, some GP practice tips could, could be one is, um, um, I find that a lot of young people these days find it really hard to um, uh, show their authentic self or their authentic mm -hmm. you. They're exposed to Instagram where perfection is displayed 
um, they on a daily basis in Facebook. Um, there's Photoshopping, um, and uh, I, I think of um, a, 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 an incident where uh, I have um, the a, a person that I know that I highly respect that has the, the the mullet test, where he used to just have a mullet, and you'll have a third of people that just wouldn't care, a third of people that will love it, but there will be a third of people that you know don't like mullets. Um, and, and that's okay. Um, the other thing is with young people, um, they're, they're great at harnessing technology and adopting new technology to actually um, uh, use it for good. Um, and um, that could be um, actually carpooling, for example, if she is 18, she doesn't have a license, um, um, she can um, find an app and um, get, um, um, get get some support that way, or even exercise groups, particularly if she's in a small town. There's often thumbs up, thumbs down um, uh, Facebook pages in, in small rural communities, and it's great to connect. Um, the other thing is, um, I think a lot of young people tend to be quite afraid of putting themselves out there. Um, mm. And um, it's sometimes helpful just to have that um, conversation with them saying, uh, just because it's uncomfortable doesn't mean it's, it's, it's actually harmful. Um, and um, just encourage them to um, take that take that step. And lastly, I think um, she's in a very unique position because um, she's able to get it that other people won't get it. For example, um, she can look out for people in the community that she might resonate with. You know, finding her people, and uh, she she might be able to connect in that way. Mm. Fabulous. Um, speaking of um, technology, I think we've lost your video, so we've got a, a still image of you looking rather chipper. Uh, but anyway, if we can get you back, I know it's gone dark in um, uh, Wagga, but there you go. Uh, thank you for that input. Was there anything further you wanted to say about either case, Jonathan? I did cut you off a bit earlier from um, the first case. I think um, as a GP, we want to actually start the process of this conversation. Um, I, I like to believe that when people come to me, I want to have a safe environment for them and a safe relationship, which will actually enable them to, to have safe conversations and to actually explore real life issues for them. Sure, great. All right. Well, thank you for that. Let's now move to um, the participants' questions, particularly, and there's been quite a few. Um, one that, I mean, one thing that leads on, we started talking about depression, particularly the risk of postnatal depression in Michelle, but I mean, depression's a, a, um, a mental health issue. It's a, it's a, a psychiatric illness. Uh, mm -hmm. People have been talking about there being um, a, an effective range of uh, mood disorder before we start to get into depression? Is that something that will draw a firm distinction between about people having loneliness as an emotional um, feeling versus uh, sort of uh, depression as, a, as an illness? Yeah. Look, I think that that's really important to uh, understand that loneliness and depression are related, but they're actually not the same construct. Um, so we do know that loneliness is actually an antecedent to more problematic depression, social anxiety, and paranoia. Um, but the way we can kind of think about loneliness is actually the negative view of the way you see your relationship, whereas depression is very much um, the, the negative view that you see of every single part of your life. Mm -hmm. So I think for for mental health professionals, you know, you can assess that, like how you know, how negative, you know, is it kind of much more global or is it very specific to just their mm -hmm. relationships um, and not conflate the two? And I think as mental health professionals, we're not very good at doing that uh, ourselves. No. Okay, Lisa, any thoughts from you about that, that distinction? Yeah, I, I think it speaks to, I think it speaks to the idea that um, it's important to really understand where someone's coming from. Um, and the degree to which perhaps um, those profound feelings of sadness and so forth might be what's actually behind um, the difficulties that they're having relating to other people or whether we're actually seeing um, these other kind of disruptions and changes actually impa impacting on someone's social connection. So, and it really speaks again to that building of trust and the continuity and the getting to know someone. Um, I suppose what we're really, it, and it can be quite difficult if, if someone's presenting um, and they can't quite understand the way they're feeling. Being able to unpack that with someone and taking the time with them 
I mean, you know, in pressured services, that can be difficult, but it speaks to how important that is. Yeah. So picking up on a question from um, Jennifer, would social anxiety be a precipitant to uh, loneliness? Would we see that as a combination? We have done some studies on that. So uh, loneliness and social anxiety actually have a reciprocal relationship. So uh, even though loneliness is an antecedent to most of your social anxiety, those who have high levels of social anxiety are also more likely to be lonely. Uh, previously, it was always kind of thought that's kind of more related to depression, but actually that relationship with, with social anxiety is much stronger. So the way I kind of think about loneliness is I always assess and identify any kind of problematic social anxiety that will get in the way of actually, um, I guess, being around people, because that would be a major barrier if we don't actually uh, address that. Mm. Okay. Any any thoughts from you, Jonathan? I think we've got you again. Oh, yeah. Um, I I think I'm um, bouncing off Michelle, um, especially you look with like you're sitting around a campfire singing Kumbaya. <laughs> but there you go. Yeah, it's it's beautiful weather in Wagga Wagga. If you want to visit, yeah. But um, like a, a lot of young people actually um uh, do do get more and more insular and more and more isolated. Mm. Um, and often um they will get into the um the gaming, um, a lot of the non-face-to-face -face things. And when you sort of take that away, for example, if they have sleep problems and you go, oh, it's all that screen time that you're doing, mm -hmm. you're actually really taking away their mm -hmm. one lifeline to um, social connection. So mm -hmm. it, it's often just being um, very slow and uh, a good listener to explore, mm -hmm. you know, what, what drives um, some of their um, behaviours and some of their thoughts. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about the use of the word loneliness? I think there's been some conversation about whether that can be a sensitive word. It's almost a pejorative word mm -hmm. that you're lonely. What does the panel mm -hmm. think about that? I, I think I, with loneliness, yeah, sorry, Lisa. Oh, I was just going to say that, I mean, I think the stigma, there is stigma around loneliness and mm -hmm. um, even to the point where um, it's a problem for doing research because um, when you want to do research on loneliness, it's partly that about recruiting people who might identify with that. And I think there's actually been some difficulties in that area. Is that right, Michelle? Mm, that's correct. I think the way you ask, um, it's depending on the population as well, sometimes when you ask a particular cohort, if you, are you lonely, they'll say no. But if you actually say, oh, do you like companionship or do you want more meaningful relationships, they'll say yes. So it's this idea of like if I say I'm lonely or I use the L word, then it must mean I'm a loser or uh, there's a connotation of fragility and vulnerability when in fact it should be seen as an innate signal to actually connect with other people just like hunger or thirst. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the word lonely has this stigma around it and I wonder are we, you know, back in the phase of, of depression where people kind of use depression used to be a word that nobody kind of talks mm. about. You know, mm. do we need to kind of build more awareness around uh, that term? Mm. And I did hear somebody say that it's different, it's okay, there's a difference between being lonely and being alone, that uh, mm. uh, obviously yes. we need to distinguish between those things as well as part of that spectrum mm -hmm. towards depression. Mm. There's a, a norm mm. normality about being alone at times too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even though uh, uh, Colt Chisel saying about loneliness quite effectively. Yeah. So the, I mean, it was sometimes people use the word solitude, which is solitude is actually wanting to be alone, uh, but not mm. actually being distressed by it, and it's actually mm. quite okay. And often people say, "Well, I'm alone by myself all the time, and I'm not mm. lonely." And that's great. Yeah. Uh, but when we say the word loneliness, is actually whether you're with or without people, but you are actually distressed by it. Mm, mm. Um, so, you know, those who are embedded within strong strong social structures can be lonely as well as because mm. they don't have the depth of those relationships mm. that they, they yearn for. Mm. So, um, and again, of course, our, um, I guess, our idea of lonely people as well as like the older adult by themselves, you know, mm. you know sitting in a, you know, some sort of nursing home kind of looking sad, they might yeah. not be lonely, um, but it's important to ask. Um, do mm. they need companionship or do mm. they need, do they want some company, for example? Mm. Sure. And I do. Up a, oh, sorry, go on with that, you, Lisa? Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to mention that I like that kind of idea that what you're saying is a mismatch between the person's kind of what they want in terms of meaningful social relationships and what they actually have. So 
Um, and that's going to vary across different people. But the other thing that I, I wanted to raise that really bounces off what, off what Michelle said was that I've done a, quite a bit of work um, with people in residential communities like um, supported residential services and those kinds of places and it's amazing how profoundly lonely people can be in a congregate living environment. So we can make assumptions about the idea that people are actually in an environment where they're surrounded by other people and yet what they say is that they have these profound feelings of loneliness. So much about um, not feeling safe in those relationships, all the difficulties that can come um, with congregate living that means that mm. people don't have that meaningful connection with other people. And sometimes that just isn't talked about with people, like people just don't ask about it because they kind of make assumptions that, oh, you're surrounded by people, you, you can't be lonely. Yeah, and or, same, you know, same in a marriage. nursing home. Yeah, yeah. yeah on a, very right. lonely marriages. Yeah, yeah that's right, nursing absolutely. home, school, nursing all sorts of places. Yeah. Yep. I'm intrigued by one of the chats that's come up here with people saying that um, a really important part of establishing a relationship with a client is naming their emotions, recognizing them for what they are and helping them. And that maybe by naming loneliness for what it is, we're, we're helping people. So that's obviously got to be something to be judged by the, the health professional. Yes, I, I think that's absolutely the, the case. It's, it's not a one size fits all the way we kind of um, deal with loneliness uh, with each person because the predictors of loneliness are also different for each person but the awareness and whether they are open to actually recognizing oh yeah that's right i am lonely uh yeah. whereas there are other people who just go no i'm not you know it's just this immediate reaction of just a pushback which i've seen as well uh and in fact when i do actually measure their loneliness they're actually the most lonely in a group setting you know just amazing how they just just reject the idea that they are lonely. So it really depends on the person and you knowing your client and you actually building or having that rapport to have that conversation. Mm. Yeah, I must say that working the last couple of months in um, the Alice Springs Detention Centre and also in remote communities around the Northern Territory, there are a lot of people crammed together in the detention centre and it's a really lonely place for a lot of people. Mm. Whereas mm. the remote communities, which um, on the map look lonely, can be just wonderfully sustaining communities. So mm. uh, I guess we can't make um, uh, assumptions about people's experience until we mm. actually ask them what's going on. Mm. Which comes mm. to a question that was asked before about, uh, for Jonathan, really, Really, I guess, in that as a GP, one of the great joys of the job is the longitudinal connection with people and also being part of a supportive network of referral options. Mm -hmm. uh, the shift towards large um, uh, general practices and uh, transient doctors and um, uh, sort of patients who shop around a little bit, is this a challenge to the relationship that can help detect and uh, assist people with loneliness in general practice? It, it is a challenge. Like um, I, I related as when I um, had my hair cut and I found out that my hairdresser was pregnant and I knew that for a big chunk of the time I wouldn't be able to get my hair cut by her. And a lot of people, um, when they um, know that you are, um, you know, from a, a big city, they're quite, they can be quite suspicious. They're polite but quite suspicious. They really want a genuine doctor, like an old school doctor that really cares for them, that is there for the long haul and that um, they don't have to rehash that story over and over again. Because for them, seeing another doctor um, can be um, quite a, um, a, a, a difficult mm -hmm. um, and sometimes um, a, a very disempowering um, mm -hmm. uh, experience for them. You have touched on one of the great similarities and professions between hairdressing and general practice. The, the parallels are <laughs> enormous in terms of that relationship. Uh, and the trust that is imbued in the two. So thank you for, for drawing attention to that. I thought I was the only one that had picked that connection. Um, other points of conversation, I'll just see what other questions have, uh, have come in. Uh, social media is a, a big one, uh, and I have heard of Instagram. Um, Jonathan's already mentioned that the um, impossible uh, models and role models that are put forward on that. Um, but. On the surface, you'd think that social media was the logical solution to loneliness, that uh, Jess must be able to connect from her uh, rural location. What does the panel think about our reliance on social media and does that help or hinder um, our approach I to think, loneliness? I think it's about the way social media is used. Is it used to initiate new relationships or is it used mm. to maintain existing ones that you've 
you've got face to face. And I think with the later, it's actually a lot more helpful. So it's not about social media per se, but how do we use social media? Mm. In addition to that, we don't actually know whether social media actually predicts uh, more loneliness. We, we don't actually have that data at the moment and we are trying to get that data but I think it's very easy to blame social media um, but you know it, the truth of the matter is that, that these products out there are, are used to attract um, users for, for fun purposes um, and not necessarily always um, for meaningful strong connections. Um, they are really favoring very brief uh, you know type of relationships and less so of the meaningful stuff so mm -hmm. it's still mm -hmm. really hard we don't have that data to actually tell us mm -hmm. that that's that's the case mm -hmm. i um i wouldn't mind in terms of um, my experience um it, it comes from my own children actually um who are, have both grown up kind of grown up in this digital age and it was something very important that one of my children said to me that i've um, thought was really interesting was that a lot of the problems that people have on social media are the same problems that they have outside of social media. So people who might be particularly sensitive to things that other people are saying, who might be very worried about their appearance, those kinds of things, it's often not just um, generated by their experience on social media. Um, and I think that's an interesting um, perspective on on the idea that sometimes we can conflate social media as being the kind of problem, whereas um, it might be what's telling us about a problem. Sure. And I just I'm going to say a few words about youth suicide for people. Um, I must say that it's something that still stays with me, a greeting father at a friend's funeral uh, saying that please don't look for your friendships on social media. That was. Uh, uh, you know, something that really had stayed with him after his daughter's mm. suicide mm. Uh, clearly mm. was um, maybe it was blaming the messenger. But uh, as as was said, the um, uh, algorithms do seem to be sent for set for popularity rather than mm -hmm. uh, through mm. sincere connection between people. Mm. That's right. Mm. But I think we we do also have responsibilities to educate children in terms of how we do relate to people and how do we build those meaningful relationships mm. where you don't have those social structures around you. For example, uh, we see that uh, a lot of young people experience high levels of social anxiety upon exiting university because they don't have that structure anymore that of what of school, of, of education, what they were used to, and then actually needing to seek help. And often the social anxiety has been maybe there for many years, I think the early mm. onset from seven to eight years old, and they don't actually deal with it until they come out of university or vocational training and realize, oh, there's no, there are no more strong social structures around me. You know, they, we need to be teaching, you know, young people how to develop healthy relationships, how to initiate and, and maintain those relationships mm. in school, you know, because mm. once they leave the education system, it's a lot more difficult. And we mm. definitely see that amongst the medical students who have a very intense medical school mm. experience and then enter the mm. uh, the workforce, uh, the health, mm -hmm. health um, scenarios. It's really quite challenging. Mm -hmm. Could I ask a question for Michelle in particular, that whether loneliness is something that we can feasibly address only with um, psychosocial or medical interventions? Mm. I mean, are there other mm. approaches? Look, I think, um, speaking from a psychologist's point of view, I would say no. I think it's... Um, everyone's responsibility, um, whether you're in the mental health field or not. I think it's really important for community approaches as well, you know, that we can use the strength of the community to help us. Um, it's, it, you know, when I think about loneliness, I can think about targeting, is it uh, using, I guess, where we're kind of approaching our problems, our case studies here today at an individual level? Can we target the relationships of, of, mm -hmm. um, of the people that um, they have? around them? Do we target it by their community or do we actually even think about kind of larger structures like societal interventions? What's the messaging around, you know, adopting good relationships and maintaining uh, good friendships throughout your life, you know? So there's so many, uh, I guess, um, I guess tiers that we can kind of think about addressing loneliness. And again, Loneliness is probably a consequence of multiple factors. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't just limit ourselves thinking about, you know, this is the only way that we can combat loneliness because there's probably multiple factors that, that drive it. Mm -hmm.
Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And um, we had a conversation with Jonathan earlier about this issue of um, being a little bit candid about ourselves. And I don't know that we've really nailed this one, that um, uh, people are asking online about whether it's appropriate for us to disclose not only a little bit about ourselves, but about our own loneliness. Is that a way of destigmatizing loneliness by saying to our clients that I've been mm -hmm. lonely too, or is that making it all about us and an inappropriate self-disclosure? What do people think? How much of it should we give ourselves of a personal experience of loneliness? Uh, I'm just sort of referring to my slides. I think in point three of the GP practice tips was don't be mm -hmm. afraid of showing the authentic you. Just want to make sure I clarify that. That's really advice that you give to the patient to um, encourage them to be authentic. Uh, but at the same time, as a practitioner, um, uh, I, I think that um, we um, do want to do not uh, not do any more harm, and um, sometimes um, uh, disclosure, um, of course, is case by case. There there'll be times that you know might um, be be um, um, be harmful if it's disclosed at the wrong time. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, but I wanted to bring it to um, Michelle and, and Lisa um, to mm -hmm. get their opinion on that. What do you think, um, Lisa, maybe? What, what, what do you think about being oh, authentic? Well, I just think being authentic is the, is the key thing. But I think we have to be very careful about the kinds of assumptions that we might make and the great differences that can be happening in terms of um, the inequalities that, that people face. So, um, you know, us as, you know, relatively privileged middle class people, our experience of loneliness can be actually quite different to some of the people that we work with who mm -hmm. um, you know, have a, such a profound mm -hmm. experience that it's very hard for us to truly relate to. So I think, and I've, you know, I, I've come unstuck around that kind of stuff myself in the past and I think we have to be really careful. Whereas on the other hand, we've talked a lot about the idea that um, we're an opportunity for people to have a conversation about what can be a really difficult um, thing to talk about. And I think some self-disclosure in the context of building that conversation and enabling that conversation is, is really important to do. So I suppose it's about our own reflection on the appropriateness of, of, of what we're doing and how, and, and even asking the person, you know, how did it feel for you when I talked about my stuff? Was that useful or not so useful? Yeah, and I mean, really, it's not just idle chat. But that conversation contains an awful lot of training and um, expertise mm. in judging how to uh, communicate. Um, yeah. And so mm -hmm. it's not, it's, it's, it's a therapeutic exchange. Um, yeah. I'm always taken by the um, statement that we have to be um, therapeutically continent in an interaction and yeah. that we're not going to let any mm. of our stuff out. But uh, I guess it's a finely, uh, finely judged um, balance and event. And yeah, what have I done for you is clearly the question we should be asking. Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing about that is that, you know, we sometimes it is hard for us to have what we might consider to be difficult conversations. And talking about intimacy, for example, I think you know it's easy sometimes for us to talk about, oh, have you got any friends and all those kind of things. But actually talking about people's experience of not having touch, um, not having anyone to be intimate with, um, that can be a much harder conversation. But that might actually be getting to um, you know what's really happening for someone in relation to their loneliness. So. Um, you know, again, it's about building trust and being able to have those kind of conversations. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you for that uh, Q&A session. I found that really helpful for myself, I must say, in my own practice. Um, I think now we should hear from each uh, participant, um, each panel member, just a couple of minutes summing up what they see has been the key issues or the key things that have come out from tonight's discussion. So maybe if we start with you, Michelle, what would you say in a couple of minutes have been the key things that you wanted to, to get across tonight? But I'm probably going to uh, speak uh, from Lisa's point, is that actually loneliness is, is a normal signal for us to connect with someone. And ignoring loneliness actually then leads to more problems, like more severe mental health problems. So I think what's really important is that we educate and ourselves and as well uh, people around us that feeling lonely is not about being a loser or fragility. It's actually similar to hunger and thirst. You've got to feed that social self. And if you don't feed that, then actually it's much uh, worse for your mental health, but also we know probably for your physical health as well. 
Okay, so we've got social determinants from Lisa, we've got sort of Maslow's hierarchy from you, Michelle. It's a, we're really getting down to the basics of being human here, and that's this, uh, what I've heard from you is about um, part of the therapeutic response as well is becoming human in our, in our treatment. Um, yeah. Jonathan, I guess you're next. What are your thoughts about uh, the main things that you wanted to bring out from tonight? Yeah, just building on that whole humanity thing, I think... Um, as, as humans, we crave relationships, but mm -hmm. I think making a safe space as a clinician, having a safe environment, um, knowing that it's a longitudinal relationship, you don't have to actually squeeze it out, are you lonely, but um, allow that person um, be part of that journey, whether it's just a, a chapter of their, um, their their life story, or um, you know, uh, it, it, it's just, um, we just want to be part of that process. Mm -hmm. Great. Wonderful, thank you very much. What about you, Lisa? What are your thoughts about the key uh, key messages from this evening? I mean, I think there's, a, there's three things for me. One is that we're we're at the forefront of, of destigmatising loneliness. So um, I think if you know we us having conversations and, and enabling those conversations is part of destigmatising. I think that I really like to always go back to that idea of treating people as though they're experts in their own lives and helping them to find the language for what's going on um, is really important. And then finally, I think we shouldn't undervalue the importance of informal support and practical support for people around loneliness. We're only a very small part of the resources that somebody might have available mm. to them. And we really need to be able to do that mapping um, and also take a non-judgmental stance in relation to um, those informal supports and, and try to be someone who's actually about um, helping the, you know the person we're working with to build stuff rather than deconstruct it. Okay, so the formal and informal supports are really important. Just to, we've got a couple of minutes, so I'm just curious again, back to Jonathan before we wrap up. Um, where you sit in your practice, what are the networks? Because that's one of our learning objectives for this evening is what um, might be in people's environments as a network of support, interprofessional network of support. When you think about a um, patient who's lonely, what's open to you professionally as formal supports or informal? Yeah, so um, I, I sort of want to talk to, about this on, on two levels. One, as a clinician, um, I think as a GP, especially a regional GP, it can be quite a lonely experience or you have the impression that you have to do it all. But um, being able to um, uh, partner with um, uh, allied health psychologists, um, social workers, um, uh, particularly um, in a multidisciplinary way, um, can actually um, really help you um, to um, be a good, 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 good clinician. But at the same time, um, being able to model that, not just um, to your um, colleagues, but to the, the patient as well, mm -hmm. um, it can, when they actually see that, hey, these people are actually working together, um, what, what's that all about? And um, it can actually help them kind of like start to think, oh, right, so I, maybe I shouldn't be on my phone at the waiting room, maybe I should just say good day to someone. <laughs> Oh, exactly. And I mean, it's clear that uh, what you've just touched on there is even as professionals, we can be very lonely in our practice. Uh, mm. A very busy hospital can be a lonely place to work. Uh, mm. a, a private practice can be very isolating when you close the door. If it's just you and the patient or you on your own, it can be something that we need to be mindful of our own uh, well-being in those sorts of environments as well. Mm. Mm. Okay. So thank you all very much. Any final comment from uh, panellists before we, we wrap up for the evening? I, I often kind of say to people that if you're not lonely now, you may be later. So I think it's really important <laughs> that we, we are very, um, I mean, very sympathetic to people who are lonely and that they're not a burden to a society because sometimes people, the way people treat lonely people is that, oh my God, you know, they're gonna, you're know, you going to take up a lot of my time, but really five minutes chatting to your elderly neighbor isn't going to hurt you. So I think it's really important that we we do our little part as well. Sure, mm -hmm. so prevention is obviously important and also this concept of anticipating loneliness that if a life event's occurred yeah. to somebody, mm -hmm. that Absolutely. they may become lonely. So why mm -hmm. not intervene appropriately socially before mm -hmm. it becomes something that should come to the attention yep. of a health professional? Mm. Absolutely.
Lovely. All right. Well, I love finishing with everybody nodding at the same time. Again, we're heading into election season. There'll be a lot of that going on, nodding in the background. <laughs> so let's now um, just uh, talk about what's coming up. I, I, I need to remind everybody that uh, there's an exit survey. So please complete that. It's really important with so many participants involved to get a sense of whether the webinars met your, your learning needs, whether we met the objectives that were set for us. Um, I want to mention to you the next webinar that's coming up, uh, which is an interesting one on um, Tuesday 16th of April, a couple of weeks away, looking at emerging minds, uh, complex needs and um, parents who are dealing with uh, children with complex needs and supporting them. Uh, so that's an important one. And also an interesting thing is that uh, MHPN is having an inaugural online conference, which is held from uh, Tuesday the 21st of May to Thursday the 6th of June. I've got no idea what that actually involves technically. Tonight's been complex enough for me. But um, there are three content streams, mental health and the military experience. And there's been some conversation on the chat board tonight about the experience of people either while they're in the military or after they're demobbed, what it feels like to suddenly be without that very structured, very challenging environment. Uh, grief and loss, and again, that came up tonight as uh, the predictors of um, loneliness are rising from a sense of grief and loss. And finally, trauma, uh, and uh, that's going to be a focus of the online conference, but there's also been a fair bit of conversation on the chat group about uh, the likelihood of trauma um, leaving people feeling lonely afterwards and contributing to that. Um, there is uh, a link uh, available to you in the uh, resources to uh, register for the conference, so we certainly hope you do. Um, just to talk about uh, the opportunities to engage with your local practitioner network, uh, please do through MHPN. Um, there are various uh, opportunities to do that through the website and also through the exit survey uh, that you are all completing right now, I'm sure, while I I'll ramble on. But if you are interested in joining the networks, I can certainly recommend it from a practitioner's point of view. And also they're quite good fun uh, getting together with colleagues who are like-minded. So please uh, go to the website and do that. Um, as always, when we complete these webinars, so we need to acknowledge that while the role of the practitioner is central to the healthcare of people with loneliness and other uh, mental illnesses or uh, affective disorders or emotional issues, uh, we've got to acknowledge the consumers, patients, and also the people who care for them, who've lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to do so. Uh, but thank you very much to the panel um, in particular, but also to all the people who have been so active um, uh, online with the chat. Um, it's been a, a, a very um, vibrant conversation going on off to the side while I'm sure there's been great attention paid to what the panel have been saying. So thank you to Jonathan. Enjoy your time there in um, Wagga. To you, Lisa, thank you very much for um, joining us tonight and for your work in the area. And also to you, Michelle, uh, at Swinburne with your leadership, academic leadership for both of you really in this area. It's great to know that the work's being done so that what we do as clinicians is underpinned by research. So we're finishing, oh, it's a pleasure. So we're finishing a minute early, which hopefully I won't be criticised for. Thank you all very much to everybody. Um, good night. Don't forget your feedback surveys and uh, we hope you'll join the panel for the um, webinar on uh, Tuesday the 14th. Good night, everybody.